Hello again, everybody. Carl Baldessar here, back with another classic rock riff review. And for this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the riffs of Jethro Tull. And we're going to especially focus on the early period, from 1969 to 1971, and specifically from the three albums, Stand Up, Benefit, and Aqualung. Now, I'm only covering three albums because there's so many great guitar riffs on these three albums that we're going to definitely have to do a part two episode. So let's dig right in into Jethro Tull's greatest guitar riffs. Up first, we go to July 25th, 1969, when the album Stand Up was released. And Stand Up was a really cool album, not just because it has this cool pop-up art in it, over my shoulder, but also because it was the first album that had Martin Barr on guitar. And it was a departure from the band's early days when it was doing more jazz and blues kind of music, and they started to stretch out into a little more progressive and folk music. So this was the first utterance of Jethro Tull with Martin Barr in that new direction of prog rock. The first song we're going to look at is a song called A New Day Yesterday. It has a couple really cool riffs on it. I'm going to show you the opening riff, and it's got this really great kind of creeping chromatic riff, which is very typical in early Jethro Tull. Here it is. <laughs> So right off the bat, man, we got Martin Barr digging in with his down picking on these chromatic runs, these three note chromatics. And it's just a really great, powerful opening riff. And they take off into the, uh, the chorus part by uh, uh, breaking away from the riff and doing this. On the studio version, they had this cool little alternate sort of variation that gets them into the chorus. It sounds like this. Yeah, really cool. So they got kind of a question and answer thing going on in there. All right, what a great riff to start off our classic rock riff review for Jethro Tull, A New Day Yesterday. Okay, for riff number two, we're going to stay right here on the album Stand Up, and we're going to play the riff for the song Sweet Dreams. This is an incredibly heavy riff, and they used to do it live, and it was just so awesome. And again, it has classic Martin Barr sort of down-picking, very thickness to it, and a great chromatic line, and you'll hear me mention these chromaticisms quite a bit with Jethro Tull. Let's take a look at this opening riff from Sweet Dreams. <laughs> Man, it doesn't get any heavier than that. Just imagine playing that in front of a crowd of 50,000 people. The thing I love about this riff is that it's going in two different directions. So we have the opening figure, which is a quick dash up from the open A down to the E. And then we return with a descending line. So check it out. So we have a little up and a little down, these little questions, little answers, and it's a beautifully composed, very, very nice sort of circular unit. One little piece of insight I want to give you on how to play that line and, and uh, really have it phrased correctly is when you do the, the descending chromatic, you want to have the last note of the chromatic really connect to the A chord that comes after it. Watch what I'm saying. <laughs> And as a matter of phrasing, I actually view that that F note, the, that F, the last note, because it's staccato and not connected like the other two, see, he pulls it off there, that's because that note is pushing us to the A power chord right after it. And I believe that that F really pushes to the A, and I think it belongs to the A, if you will, if you're thinking about it as a sentence. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, just a way to think about things in terms of phrasing and groupings of phrases. And so now for figure number two in the song, we have this great Martin Barr kind of power chord vibe. And there's a classic little Martin Barr sort of technique when he's doing an A power chord or any kind of power chord. Sometimes he adds the upper voicings in the chord like this. So check it out. And you get that really bright sound versus just a barred A. You get. Yeah, so that little sparkle on top of the A where he's barring on the fifth fret adds a nice little pop of brightness to it. The other thing which will drive you mad, and as we get further down into the repertoire of Jethro Tull, is they never do anything the same way twice. So <laughs> you can't rely on learning a pattern. Even on this little power chord thing, you know, the figure is, it has the A, and then it goes to C, G. And the second time through, you think he's gonna do the same thing again? Uh-uh, he's gonna go A. It's gonna go A to G to C. So they're always turning stuff around, they're moving stuff along over the bar lines. It's just really, really just difficult to remember all this stuff, so. So yeah, you have to really be on your toes when you're playing Jethro Tull. All right, for riff number three, we're going to go to the Benefit album, which was released on the 20th of April in 1970. Now this album, Benefit, was actually probably my favorite Jethro Tull album of all times. So much so that when I had a chance to meet Ian Anderson, I brought that album so he could sign it for me, because really, I just love the mood of this album. And the song we're gonna cover here for riff number three is a song called Sun. And now it's a two-part song. I'm just going to focus on the guitar riff on the first part of that song. It goes like this. Now, it looks like a very simple riff, but in fact, it's really crazy, and it's a classic Jeff Tall where they're doing these riffs and these meters that kind of cross over the, the bar line, and you really have to keep track of what you're doing here. So let me actually count this for you. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. So what's really weird is that when they turn that around, they get to the F sharp part, that comes in on beat two. That's what's nutty about that, you know? So you've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. You could, you could explain that any way. You could say it's a bar of five or whatever, but it's in four. You just have accents that are on really not strong beats, and it's really crazy to keep track of this stuff. For riff number four, we're gonna stay with the album Benefit, and the song is called To Cry You a Song. It opened up the second side of the album, and I think this riff is my favorite on the album Benefit. I just love the riffs, I love the figures, there's a lot of harmony guitar on it, and I really wanna demonstrate these little half-step movements that they do in harmony. So let's take a look at the opening riff of To Cry You a Song. <laughs> Right, so that great opening riff with those little half steps, it's so beautiful. And underneath it, he's got a harmony guitar line, which goes like this. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful harmony line, and all these little half steps are so great. 
So what they're really doing on these riffs are what I would consider decorating by half step. So we're kind of in this sort of G minor pentatonic world here. And you know, we're sort of just and we're just decorating with half steps. Or over here. And they either decorate from below or above. And so that's something to think about even when you're doing a guitar solo. Let me demonstrate. So this may give you a quick sort of idea as to how you could use sort of these half step moves while you're improvising, okay? So let's take this G pentatonic. Um, and think about the frames that we're playing in. So we really basically are playing all the notes on the third fret in G minor. And what if we just decorated from below a half step on each one of those notes? Right, and the same thing from above. Or you could actually decorate from below or above. And then all you have to do is just make sure you're coming back to kind of the chord tones or sort of the pentatonic scale tones. And actually you will create a lot of different sounds. You'll inadvertently create octatonic scales. You'll create Lydian scales. You'll do all sorts of cool things. And it's just by decorating a half step above or below. Let me demonstrate. So that's just decorating a half step above and below and you just open up this incredible color of sounds. And honestly, that's what that riff kind of reminds me of is that you have this freedom to kind of decorate with these half steps. So there you go, a little guitar lesson with To Cry You A Song. Okay, for riff number five, it's gonna be the last riff from the album Benefit. This is called Play In Time. Kind of funny that Jethro Tull would say that because it's very difficult to play in Jethro Tull time. And this is no different than that. It's just a couple of figures with little chromatic runs, again, yet we're dealing with chromaticism here in Jethro Tull. But it's a little catchy little ditty. So let's hear the riff for Play In Time. <laughs> So it's not that difficult to get on the surface, but to actually get those little triplety feels can be a little fussy, so you're gonna to have to take your time with it. I do like how they turn it around for the verse figure where he's singing, and they add these little perfect fourth chords in there. Check this out. <laughs> Yeah, try that, it's a little fussy. It's not as easy as it looks. So on the chorus figure, it's just a really, a, it's just a two chord movement here from a C to a B flat. What I love about it, it's sort of in a triplet feel and the way they come out of it, again with this little half step sort of toggling note, that they're actually doing a crescendo. You don't hear many bands or guitar players in rock using crescendos, but check this out. See, it goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> really cool that they're actually doing a crescendo in rock music. I just love it. All right, on to riff number six, and actually riffs six through ten are all going to be on the quintessential Jethro Tull album called Aqualung. It was released on the 19th of March in 1971, and we're going to start off with none other than the riff Aqualung. Now, I'm going to play it for you here, but I'm not going to really dig into it because 
that's a cue for you to go check out my episode because I did a very, very detailed breakdown of the song Aqualung. So go to my channel. You can actually find it right up here in the video. And, uh, but I'm just going to play you the riff because it's just too much fun not to play. Here you go, Aqualung. <laughs> So there you have the great Aqualung riff, and actually, if you wait till the end of this video, you'll have a link to take you to the episode where I will tell you everything you want to know about the song Aqualung, and then some. All right, on to riff number seven. We have Cross-Eyed Mary, again from the album Aqualung. And this is a mighty handful on guitar, and it's fantastic Martin Barr all the way, a lot of chunkiness. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this into two parts. We're gonna give you the verse part, and then we'll give you the chorus part. And the verse part I'm gonna do is a little later in the song because Martin Barr is doing some fill elements that are really cool. It goes like this. into the chorus you go. All right, now let's take a look at this fantastic chorus. This groove engine is unbelievable. Check it out. Did you notice how Martin Barr actually upstrokes the G chord on that riff? He does that a lot with power chords. He'll upstroke it to get you a real bright, shimmery sound. So check it out. He'll... Yeah, so he gives you that reverse rake on that, and it actually takes all the upper strings and gives you the brightness first. So he does that a lot. It's a really cool Martin Barr technique. People would have you done, locked him in his golden cage, his golden cage. Here we have the song, My God, for our eighth riff. It's just an epic piece of music. It starts off with this haunting, beautiful, kind of classical Spanish guitar intro. And I got to really hand it to Ian Anderson. He is really an unsung great guitar hero. He really can play the acoustic guitar like not many people. And he really shows his guitar skills on this song at the intro. The first minute is him as a solo artist playing this beautiful lilting melody around these two plaintive chords, these, the A minor and the B seventh, which is inverted because it has an A in, in the root. And his lyrics are so profound and it really sets up this sort of breathless moment when the band comes in with this very powerful, powerful rock intro. That's where we're going to pick it up from here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's one rotation through the big riff. Now, did you notice I was counting along while I was playing that, partly because I'm playing by myself, but also because you better be able to count when you're playing Jethro Tull music, man, because they have total disregard for bar lines. And uh, when I play a lot of progressive rock music, which I've done in the past, is that Sometimes you just can't count in traditional time, in the traditional meter of the song. You just have to remember when you have these moments, how long the moments are. And on this particular lick, I know that I've got a five eighth note count. We're kind of in six eight here, and I know I've got five eighth notes that I've got to hang on to this E flat here. So when I go one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And that's my cheat. You know, I do that all the time in progressive rock just to make sure when I have a moment, because when you're practicing by yourself, you might not uh, actually hold it for an odd number, like five beats. You might just, your body clock might just say, let's just do that for four. Well, you can't do that with Tull because actually the fourth time through, they give you one that's only four times. So you get this thing, you get one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. You know, so you have to turn it around. So anyway, that's a little cheat that I do when I'm doing, you know, uh, kind of difficult time signatures, especially in progressive rock. I just know that if I have notes that are strange and long and odd numbers, I'll just count that particular note and just fall back into the groove because there's a pulse going on all the time. So when we get to the chorus, okay, we have, again, we're in this 6-8 meter, and we're, we're playing these sort of, you know, jolly little, you know, <laughs> rhythm chords here. But again, they're shifting where the accents are. So we're in 6-8, but yet the, the first chord, D, they're only going to give 5 eighths, and then the G chord, the second chord, is going to get 7 eighths. So it's going to do this. So it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And then one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, one, two, three. So you want to join Jethro Tull? <laughs> <laughs> you better be able to mess up accents on regular time signatures. The only other little tidbit I would add is that on the live versions, Martin Barr would actually change that big powerful riff. He'd actually do a B-dom 7 sort of chord on it. He would go like this. <laughs> Yeah, giving you that really, really nasty B seventh chord, which sort of echoes to the actual classical guitar. He's going, you know, so he's echoing that two chord phrase by doing that. Very, very cool. If you love Jethro Tull as much as I do, man, I grew up on this music so much so that I was influenced by it enough to actually write a song and dedicate it to Jethro Tull. It's on my album, Collinwood Yards. The song is called To Coin a Phrase. It's really cool. It's got classic kind of Martin Barr. It's got Ian Anderson type lyrics because we're taking Shakespeare's lyrics and all the phrases that he coined, putting them into a song. It's really, really quintessential sort of Jethro Tull sounding. Check it out. Coin a Phrase on my album, Collinwood Yards, at carlbaldasarmusic.com. Okay, on to riff number nine, and we have the song Hymn 43, and I think this is probably my favorite song on the album. It's so cool, and it actually proves the point that a riff doesn't actually have to be anything other than a rhythm. So we'll take a look at that. Let's look at the song Hymn 43. Okay, before we get into the iconic riff of the song, this sight rhythm, which I'll show you in a moment, we have these really great opening chords, which start on D, and they go like this. Now you know what comes next, I bet. <laughs> Let's show you that great rhythm. It starts off with a musical line, a great sort of uh, lick on the guitar, and then it goes into the rhythm riff. It goes like this. Right.
Right. So first of all, what I want to point out is that that rhythm is a really important rhythm to know. And so when you're learning to sight read, basically it's like learning to read. And you know, when you first start out, you're trying to sound out every letter and every word before you say the word. But eventually you start seeing groups of letters together and just chunk things and see the word. It's the same thing in kind of sight reading rhythms. And eventually you'll see that there's these groups of rhythms that are just a sound. And this is a classic sound, the you know, and that rhythm pattern looks like this, okay? It's a 16th with an eighth note and a 16th. And when you put them in a chain, you get that dika, ta dika, ta dika, ta dika, you know, where the last 16th is actually linking up with the first 16th of the next bar or the next uh, rhythmic number. So it's really important to kind of learn these sort of sight rhythms. And this is a great way to actually know what that sounds like. And here's another little tip that I, I learned from this song and generally what I, how I approach music is that I actually have a song when I see a rhythm, a basic rhythm, I actually equate it to a song. So I know when I see that rhythm figure, that sight figure, I know that that sounds like that because I'm thinking of hymn 43. And I do that for like 12 other basic sight rhythms. I just immediately know what it sounds like so I can play it when I see it. I don't have to sit there and count it out in 16th notes. All right, so let's take a look at that part from a guitar execution. Now, the first thing you have to do is that, again, it's Martin Barr, and when you have Martin Barr, the way you're going to pick things is by down picking, correct. And so he does that here. He's got that chunky right classic martin bar but you might think this is a throwaway thing the way he's doing that sort of sight rhythm and how he's doing the chunk but actually you got to actually know where to put your hands on that to get the best chunky sound okay so watch what i do so what i do is i brought my hand up the neck i'm muting do not mute on the 12th bar or any bar that has artificial harmonics on it you don't want to you don't want to be near there when you're doing it. So I'm kind of like generally up in the 11th, right? And I'm moving my hand away from the brittle sound over here by the, uh, the bridge. I'm moving it over here towards the neck. And more importantly, I'm actually chunking more on the bottom three strings. So when you take all that together, you get a good... You might not think it matters, but it actually matters a lot, and I think that's what made that figure work. The other cool thing about the arrangement of the song is that when they're actually doing that figure and then they have the, the chicky chunk part there, they have solos that are going on. It's either the, uh, the flute, or it's a piano, or it's Martin Barr's guitar lick. You know, he does this one here. I love this one. Yeah, I love that one. It's so expressive. So there you go, hymn 43, welcome to the church of Jethro Tull. <laughs>
So you're never going to get the same thing twice when it comes to the arrangements in Jethro Tull. Let's check that out one more time because it's fun to play. <laughs> Yeah, and then you go into the great B kind of single note riff, get the downward picking from Martin Barr, and you get this riff here. Yeah, it's such a cool little lick, and you've got those off beats in it too, the up the upstroke off beats, just so up, up. Up, up, up. You know? So you really gotta get all that going with the down pick. Yeah, is that great? And then you get the uh, the rhythm chords, which are super. So it's a Okay, and that winds up our classic rock riff review for Jethro Tull in the early periods of 1969 to 1971. We are definitely going to need a second episode here because there's so many great riffs that came after this. And you guys can help me out by suggesting some really cool guitar riffs in Jethro Tull. So please send them my way. And I want to thank all my subscribers. I want to welcome my new subscribers. And please help us find more subscribers. We definitely want to keep this thing going. And it helps by having subscribers. So thank you again. We'll see you soon. I'm Carl Baldessar. <laughs>